What we want to do in this section is to discuss some of what we think are the best policies to deal with the durable inequalities that we've been talking about. Things like your country of birth, your parentage, the gender to which you're born, all really contribute in really unfair ways to where you end up. So maybe we should start, Branko, and uh, talk a little bit about borders. Can you tell me about what you think about borders and what to do about inequality? When we discuss inequality, when you come to the global level, there are relatively few tools that you actually have because obviously there is no global governance, you know, you don't have distribution between the countries and so on. But uh, borders are paradoxically, interestingly, one of the tools that you have with which you can deal with global inequality and global poverty. Now, there is very little doubt that if you do any sort of uh, simulation or analysis that, let's suppose, start with the extreme position of a removal of borders. Now, the removal of borders would lead to a reduction in global poverty and would almost certainly lead to a reduction of global inequality and to very significant gains in GDP. So these gains, I think, have been variously estimated between, if I remember correctly, 70% to actually 200% uh, gain and so on. There is really no doubt that this would happen. The, the situation then is the following. This is a policy which is good for poverty, good for inequality, good for GDP growth. And the question then is like, why don't we do that policy? And moreover, it is the policy which is fully consonant or which is very much in agreement with the essential tenets of globalization. So if we are in favor of globalization, we are in favor of movement of capital, we are in favor of movement of goods, uh, technology, ideas, and so forth. So why is labor different? And I think this is an interesting question to be asked also from people who are very much in favor of movement of capital, but they don't like to talk about labor. But the two th things should be really treated equivalently because they are obviously both factors of production. So there is no reason why one should be stuck uh, in the place where they are and the other not. So that, I think that was, that's my sort of opening line and a position simply to acknowledge the importance of free mobility of labor. Then the problem, of course, becomes more difficult because then you say, is there something very specific to labor that really does not make it transferable from country to country without creating some problems? So people would say, well, yes, maybe that actually labor is different from capital because capital really does not change internal relations in the country where it goes. But I don't think it's fully sort of adequate position because very often movement of capital to a different country brings, of course, different relations of production, brings actually maybe some things which are good, you know, maybe reduces gender inequality, maybe reduces, you know, discrimination against gay population or something. But it does also create changes into that community where capital goes. So I think it's only partially correct. Then, of course, you can say, well, maybe that labor does create more of a commotion or more problems of absorption by the community where it, where it moves to than capital. And that's quite possible, you know. If people were simply avatars without any other characteristics, uh, there is no, of course, reason why they should not move between the countries. But it could be that by movement to a different country, they, of course, bring cultural sort of traits, they bring a certain customs, their way of behavior, and so on. So they, there are two then grounds on which I think people object to the movement of labor. One is that they might argue, for example, like George Borges argues, that foreigners to some extent are bringing, let's call it, bad customs from their own country, and they start undermining the good customs or institutions, to put it more broadly, in the country where they arrived. Uh, that, I think, is a very dubious proposition because particularly when it is applied to the United States, it would basically undermine any movement of labor into the United States. So if the migrants, according to Borges, bring this sort of institution-destroying features now, how come they didn't bring that, that you know, 150 years ago? What was different? But there is a final, I think, defense 
which is a defense based on essentially uh, some uh, domestic cultural values that you believe actually should be maintained. And I think that when you come to that defense, it's very difficult to actually reject it because it's not based on empirical stuff. It's based like, I really feel like I would like to go to a mic cafe all the time and talk to people who speak my language, and this is the end of the story. So you cannot just say, well, but you will have more income or whatever. It's really sort of the end. So going now to my proposal, which is actually in my forthcoming book, Capitalism Alone, but was also in, in less developed in global inequality, taking that sort of um, irreducible position that comes at the end, I then sort of started thinking, like, are we, aren't we in a danger that by insisting on the first position, which was position of open borders, we end up by scaring so much people who are against migration that they go to the other extreme where actually we create Fortress Europe, Fortress United States, and have no migration. So then I said, okay, let's try to think if we can find some kind of a compromise solution. And my compromise solution is based on the following sort of claim that indigenous population would be more likely to accept migrants if the migrants uh, have fewer possibility to share in what is what I call the citizenship rent. Imagine that the citizenship rent is actually the bundle of advantages, including from your wage up to your retirement pension and all that, that citizens of the rich countries receive compared to an equivalent citizen in a poor country. So if you then accept that there is a negative relationship, in other words, that there is a trade-off, that I'm a citizen, let's suppose, of a rich country, and I'm more willing to accept citizens of other countries if I share less of that rent with them. I think that actually then you have this negative relationship and the extreme point would be that you give them almost nothing of your citizenship rent and then you would say, okay, I would accept more of them. If you accept this negative relationship, then the issue is finding, and there is no single solution, but the issue is finding for different countries at which point you would actually uh, uh, choose, which point you would choose where you would actually share some of the citizenship rent that you have and accept some migration. So that's the compromise solution. So it's not a simple compromise that you take your position, my position, and we actually split in half. It's a, it is the compromise in the sense that you draw this negative relationship, but that negative relationship enables you also to choose the, the corner solutions or any point which is on that uh, line or that curve which exists. But now that approach then leads you almost naturally to address the following issue. If these people come here to, let's suppose, rich country, they cannot have exactly the same bundle of rights. Now, which bundle of rights do I want to give them, which bundle I don't want to give them? I think when it comes to their employment, you have to give them the entire bundle because of, you don't want ha to have two, two people doing the same job and being paying differently. But when it comes to civic rights, including citizenship and the right to stay permanently and to have an open path to citizenship, there you can actually start playing with that. You have a circular migration whereby you come for five years. This is not ideal, but you come for five years, then you go back. You are actually you have migration which is linked to jobs, like many actually in the US, in Canada, in the UK, you have that type of migration already. But two points are, you don't share the full bundle of rights and privileges and income. And secondly, you really move towards something which you might call away from the binary nature of citizenship. That either you're a citizen or you're not. In this case, you really end up somewhere in between. You are neither citizen, fully citizen, nor you do have zero rights. You are somewhere in between. And it's up to each individual country or time to choose what is that between solution. So this is a, you know, a long introduction to the proposal, but I really want to emphasize that that proposal is not made sort of lightly or just because I just think that it would be kind of neat to have a replica of Singapore or Gulf uh, Council countries in Europe. It is simply made uh, as, as a realization that if we do not go for some flexible solution, we might end up in a, really in a situation where there will be no migration, no reduction in global inequality, no reduction in global poverty, no increase in GDP. So that was really sort of a, what the French call PLA. It's actually a solution which is an, an attempt to avoid the worst possible outcome.
One of my favorite and the most important policy proposal that I would have is to once again commit very strongly to a sort of universalism of certain rights for people who are part of your economy. So for example, really high quality education being available to everybody. Um, this might seem like it's a no-brainer, but it is the fact that in many economies you have dual systems or multiple systems where some people have access to the kind of skills and access to the kind of training that allows them to be part of this kind of world and some people don't. So that as a very basic point, I also happen to, to think that if you take a look at the history of, uh, uh, let's say, the OECD countries over the last 100, 150 years, it is the case that one of the most important uh, things that we created, that, that the world's created, was that the, the welfare state, which actually worked between, say, the 40s and the 70s, right. really worked to create a sort of universalism that everybody was part of the same thing. And since that time, I, I've seen what I like to call, in some sense, the secession of the rich. Not just in OECD countries, but across the world, people are getting more and more private in terms of their access to these critical goods. Education being one, but health, even basic things like the environment around you is not any more guaranteed as a right and as, as a high quality right that's there. So, what that involves might might be more um, a taxation. We, that it really depends on what what uh, is the configuration of that particular society. But I do think that in the absence of that, one of the key things that we're going to miss out is the fact that unless you have a, a, a notion that everybody has a stake in a particular um, high quality right, then you're going to always have these divisions grow because clearly the rich have an incentive to not open up this right to many people. As you were saying uh, at one point when we were having this discussion that there's a value to having a very high quality uh, education and to exclude others. Do you want to add to that? Well, uh, simply I, I, what you said, actually, I totally agree. Yeah. It is that essentially <clears throat> what is now happening to some extent in the rich countries is the process of third worldization of those countries. Because in the third world, generally speaking, what you had in the 70s and the 80s when there was universalism in the rich world, in the, in the third world, in the less rich countries, you had essentially the rich uh, uh, seceding or the rich uh, sort of going and having from electricity, with their own electricity generators, their own health system, their own system of occupational pensions or private pension, their own system of health health and education. What is now happening in the rich world is somewhat similar in the sense that when you have to choose, rich people like prefer to choose private provision of certain services. Mm -hmm. Then as you were saying, what happens then, they have absolutely zero incentive to continue paying taxation for the services that they never use. So you have a, a, sort, of a, a, a sort of a negative uh, vicious, circle. A, a vicious circle, which happens that you, once you, you, you have the rich uh, be, uh, sort of not being part of the system, they absolutely have no in incentive at all to maintain the system. And I think that this is a danger, and we see that in, in many instances, including, you know, things which were part of the usual uh, sort of package of social transports or social benefits, including pensions, for example, which, you know, become much more private than to use they used to be, and even, of course, health, which despite all the, uh, you know, public outcry in the U.S. actually has not moved towards a, a single-payer system. So, you know, we do have that, uh, that uh, and education that has become actually much more privatized than it used to be. You were talking about the rich seceding, and one of the things that we also talked a little bit about was why the rich are rich and about taxation. Uh, specifically, what I wanted to ask about is this division between the rich and poor uh, that is divided, that, that is predicated upon uh, capital ownership versus uh, you know, uh, returns to labor. We talked about the labor share and the capital share. So I think we both agree there needs to be sort of a deconcentration of uh, capital. And so maybe you could speak a little bit about the opportunities and possibilities mm -hmm. for something like Yeah, I'm uh, very grateful that you asked that because, uh, uh, you know, the first question that you asked me, that was about labor. So it was really the migration of labor, a movement of labor between the countries. Now, the second one really addresses the issue of capital, and that's actually the issue within nation states. We know 
that capital or the ownership in general is very highly concentrated. And it's not an exaggeration to say that in all rich countries, about 10% of people really own practically the entire country financially. In the US, it is actually they own 92% of all financial wealth of the United States. So it's a very heavily concentrated. Now, this may be bad for many other reasons, but there is one reason which I think is very important is the following one, is that essentially as rich countries become richer, they also not only become richer because the, the value of goods and services that is produced annually is becoming larger, they also save, they become richer in terms of overall wealth. So if you get every year like richer in terms of wealth, and if the return on that wealth does not fall commensurately or the same proportion in which the wealth goes up, you actually have what I call the curse of wealth, which essentially means that the share of national income, which is going to belong to, to people who have wealth, is going to grow larger. And that's exactly what you said before, what we observed for now 20 years, that the share, capital share has increased. So if we have that increase in the capital share, and if the wealth is so heavily concentrated, we have a quasi-automatic transmission from high capital share into high interpersonal inequality. So then essentially what you have, you have rising capital share, you have at the same time pari passu increasing inequality. And there is certainly a certain point where you can say that rising inequality is no longer politically sustainable, it's not desirable, it reduces or eliminates inequality equality of opportunity and so on. So then the question becomes, what do you do? It's, it's similar, I think, actually, when you think of the reasoning, it's similar to the issue of migration. You say, what do we do then to actually break that link, which quasi-automatically sort of relates functional income inequality to interpersonal income inequality? And there are several possibilities. One of them, you can actually start taxing capital much more than, than you are doing now. The next one is you can actually impose inheritance taxes which are much higher than what is now. The third one, which actually I find you know, very appealing, and I'll explain why, you can either through taxation make ownership of financial capital more appealing to the middle class by giving them special favors, like for example, including insurance that actually, if you have $5,000, you're not going to invest that now because you're afraid you're going to lose all the money that you have. But if you have an insurance that would guarantee that, that for small, obviously small investments, that you are not going to lose 100%, but at most you would lose 20%, or 30%, you would actually have more people who would do that. Then you can have employee stock ownership plans where actually workers have stocks in their own company. So whatever it is, uh, if you move toward deconcentration of capital ownership, then you would actually break that automatic link of which I was talking before. And then technically speaking, if we were ever to reach the situation where capital were uh, as unequally distributed as labor, mm -hmm. which is really a long way because labor, of course, inequality of labor is large, but it's not nearly as large as concentration of inequality of capital. In that case, we really wouldn't have to worry about the rising capital share. I mean, to mm -hmm. make it very an extreme case, let's suppose that only robots exist and the people don't even work, that actually robots are, are really owned by individuals. If they are all these machines that we call robots, if these machines of that capital is owned more or less equally by all, each of us, then obviously we don't have to worry about greater inequality. You might own two machines, I own one machine, <coughs> our incomes are not going to be the same, but it would be entirely different if we had 100 machines and you owed all 100 of them and I had zero. So this is the, the logic uh, why I think actually deconcentration of capital ownership is, is really quite important. And I think it's important also, the last point on this, is that to, to realize that when we make these recommendations, and I'm going to ask you now about macroeconomic recommendations that you would make, but that we actually do not make them just out of the blue because we just thought it was a kind of nice recommendation. I think it's very important to realize and to explain that recommendation comes as a sort of last step of a certain logical argument. You know, one of the things that uh, you mentioned, this whole question about labor shares and capital shares and their dynamic and trying to understand how actually they evolve uh, through time and in, in our concrete historical uh, last 25 years, one of the things that I think has been um, quite understudied until the last maybe three or four years is this declining labor share of income. And I think an extremely important set of recommendations that you can make is that you really need to run the economy uh, 
at a much higher level of aggregate demand, especially in the OECD countries, because one of the things we've, we've seen is that whenever you have sufficient demand, whenever you have an economy which is growing, um, it absorbs labor, wages do go up, and it turns out that those are maybe the most important th ways in which you actually empower people who are working to get higher wages. Labor markets become tighter. Now clearly this is, we've had a, a set of policies in the last 20, 25 years which have not been in favor of that kind of movement. That whenever the labor share goes up or whenever wages go up, there's always a tendency, especially among, um, uh, among monetary policy makers, to squash that. What we've seen in the last 10 years is that the implicit threat that if wages rise, you're going to have inflation yeah, yeah. has not come to bear. So it seems to me that we've lost, w workers have lost decades worth of uh, potential wage gains precisely because of this fear of a phantom inflation. Um, I happen to think that there is, uh, the natural rate of unemployment is actually a, a construct which we should get rid of, but that's, for macroeconomics, that's a, that would be a really, um, radical step, <laughs> but, but uh, certainly uh, the notion that we should react every time wages go up uh, to mm -hmm. some sort of, uh, and really crush any sort of movement um, in increasing aggregate demand, I think that's a big problem. So allow the economy at points to run, as they say, hot. As long as there's no inflation, it's a good thing for the wage share to go up. It's a good thing in terms of uh, inequality reduction. <laughs> I wanted to ask you one small follow-up to this question on capital share, which is that there is also an element that wealth is transmitted from generation to generation. Right, yeah. So maybe you could just take, say a little mm -hmm. bit about why a wealth tax or a tax on capital in right. general is, has sort of longer term impact. So. But you know, just before I do that, let me just go back to what you said about labor share. Yeah. Because in reality, the two things are fully complementary. We are yeah. talking about, in one case, we are talking about the rising capital share and how that rising capital share should be stopped because because not only we don't like capitalists, because yeah. we actually essentially have the situation of an unsustainable increase in inequality. A different way to stop that is actually by having higher labor share. So the two things are really fully complementary. In other words, if you had a higher labor share, if labor shares now were actually increasing and capital share was going down, we would not even have this conversation about deconcentration of capital ownership. Now, deconcentration would be still important for the second, for the second question that you asked me about transparency mission of advantages, but it would not be as important for a current inequality as it is now. Now for the transmission of, of advantages, I think it's absolutely, uh, it's very clear, it's a no-brainer that if you don't have high inheritance tax and you're actually able to transmit all these advantages, first I'll start with money, financial advantages, then housing and all that to the children, they would of course have a huge advantage compared to the children that don't have that, uh, you know, uh, transmission of so much financial capital and housing capital and other things. In order to, to sort of reduce that advantage, because we are not really ever going to eliminate that advantage, you know, in roles it was under the title of liberal equality, and that was actually a call for inheritance tax. He was quite aware that that's not going to go long sufficiently enough to reach what is called, what he calls democratic equality, which would require actually further further equalization. So we're never going to get there, but by large, by high inheritance tax, we would actually reduce the transmission of that money or capital advantage. But there will be two other advantages that would still remain, and I think actually we have to think of them as well. The first one on which I really think we cannot do very much is the advantage of all the connections, information, and contacts that, of course, rich people and their kids enjoy. So there is nothing to do about that because obviously you cannot legislate that. It is something which comes with your, you know, upbringing. But we see from the work, for example, by Heckman and others, how important it is. So it's really this sort of acutularization at a very early stage. But the third thing, I think, be, uh, is something that we could do um, things about, and this is the issue of education. Because particularly, I think, in the United States, but now it's spreading to Europe, the education has also moved toward a double equilibrium situation. Is that actually you have a, a very high percentage of 
of uh, people who are in top schools who come from, very, from rich families. And although until recently we couldn't even get the data for that because these schools didn't want to release that, we now have the data from Chetty, we have data from Piketty and all that to, so, to see practically like one for one correlation between likelihood of acceding to the high level schools and your income level. That of course means that the, these prestigious schools are very expensive and by being very expensive, which I think is in the interest of the rich, they basically eliminate a large chunk of the population from ever being able to send the kids there because it, it is prohibitively expensive for them. So you really limit, uh, you have really constraint on, on, uh, on uh, competition for the children of the rich. So that's one thing. Secondly, as I mentioned actually yesterday, it actually, there is another constraint which is essentially almost automatic graduation from these schools, whereby the entire effort is on admission. Now the entire effort on admission means that the entire financing for the children's education really cannot start like two years before you go to the college where maybe you can say, okay, well, I'm going to take the test and the test would be egalitarian because in order to do well on the test, you have to have like, you know, 12 to 14 years of parental investment in education. So when you come to that point, you have really people who have entirely different backgrounds and likelihood to accede to that education. So you have then really both money directly in terms of tuition, but also the money in terms of investment that are both discouragement for access to education to everybody. And then, of course, you have a double equilibrium because people who go to these schools, as we know also studies for that, they have significantly higher wage premium, mm -hmm. higher wages, so they have, they command a very large premium, which sometimes I've seen numbers going up to three to one for the same sort of education level. If you measure it four years of college education or like six years of college plus graduate school. And then they, they essentially replicate or, or sort of use all the advantages that they have received through, through parental connections so, or parental background. So you basically have financial advantage, you have the network slash information net, net advantage, and you have educational advantage. As I said before, on the network informational, there is, I don't think, anything we can do. Obviously, you can make information more widely accessible and all of that, but you cannot have policies to stop information being conveyed from family to children, but on transmission of advantages from, you know, ownership, you can actually have much higher taxation, and on transmission of advantages through education, you can have a much better public school system that would be then accessible to everybody and would be of a sufficiently high quality that actually that premium of which I was speaking before would actually diminish or be eliminated. So I think these are the, re the, the sort of uh, kind of a thinking that would go towards uh, uh, sort of evening out the, the, you know, the field, you know, between the, the, the offspring of the rich and those uh, of the middle class. We've spoken about four of the five durable inequalities that we mentioned. I just wanted to sort of end with speaking about one, uh, one that we hadn't, which is about categorical inequalities. The issue is that with each uh, of the categorical inequalities, they're so deeply and profoundly sociological and cultural that it often depends from, from society to society what's appropriate and what's not. But it seems to me that one can say something somewhat general about gender, it being such a widespread and deep um, mm. inequality. There's two or three things that we noted, and maybe the two things that I noted which were very important. One is the extent to which women are doing unpaid work versus men, and the other is the extent to which women are consciously or unconsciously disadvantaged in the labor market. So with respect to the, to the former, I think one of the things that it might be useful for us culturally uh, to go towards is to try to actually make especially things like childcare much more easy right. for, for women. So universal childcare, especially in the West where it's possible, but really um, paid care, even in developing in, uh, you know, middle income countries, paid, uh, paid leave for taking care of your children with a guarantee that you're going to have a job after that. So it doesn't become impossible for women to uh, undertake that and hopefully move to paid paternity leave so you actually have a situation where that burden is equally uh, spread, specifically for childcare. With respect to entering the labor force, there's a lot of interesting so uh, sociological literature about anti-bias training and so on, but I think an important thing to, to think about, which is 
relatively radical, except in a few countries, is to have salaries be uh, known. You know, this is something that yeah. people don't. Information is actually very important in many of these these aspects, and to the extent that companies and um, <coughs> and uh, law can be passed to make at least certain. Um, uh, wages known. We know, for example, we can do that with public universities. When I was at a, a public university, mm. my wage was known. There's no reason for that not to be the case uh, across many other situations, and that I think would at least begin steps to reducing the penalty that women face in uh, in in entering the labor market. I don't know if you have anything else. No, I, I actually think it's a, it's a very important topic because <clears throat> we are basically here talking about 50% of labor force, so 50% yeah. population. Discrimination is, for obvious reasons actually, uh, not only because it is unjust, but it's actually, of course, irrational in terms of economics because obviously like countries where you have not, you have few women in labor force are basically sort of cutting themselves off from the ability to use uh, sort of knowledge and the skills of many people. Uh, I want to add on, on this uh, several uh, points, if I may. I was critical in global inequality about uh, categorical inequality being uh, considered uh, how should I say, only in terms of its averages. Yes. Because very often we can actually, when we talk about whether it is discrimination on racial basis, gender basis, or some other, we basically say we run a regression, we actually, or we look actually whether the, the wage that women have on average is the same as equivalent men. Uh, but that, however, is absolutely the first step. It's a necessary step, but I don't think it's a sufficient step because you can have still a very a high level of inequality, and we actually see that with wages. Women's wages start now ap approaching and mimicking much more men's wages, but it doesn't make inequality of wages less. Mm -hmm. In other words, actually, if women's wages were totally to mimic men's wages, which actually we might come to that position maybe in 10 or 15 years, then you would actually have a very very high inequality, even maybe higher than now, because paradoxically, women's wages by women being discriminated and actually having wages less, and very often having jobs that are really in a lower part of the income distribution, uh, overall income inequality is thereby reduced. So as women actually move into the labor force and become really interchangeable with men, unless we work on reduction of inequality as such we really would have a situation that there would be no gender inequality, but inequality of wages and possibly income would actually even increase. So I think it is important, again, to realize that when we talk about these things, we are really not talking only about the averages. We are always talking about the distribution as well. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing. Secondly, I could not agree more, actually, on the fact, on the need, in many cases, to make the knowledge of wages actually much more public, because it would, of course, reduce discrimination. It would make it much more difficult to pay men like twice as much as you're paying a woman for the same job. And I was recently noticing, we actually had a similar discussion. There are really almost very few, uh, one is that is actually when you work in the public sector in the US, you have the wages being uh, sort of known. Uh, another, uh, very few areas where where this exists. One of them is, for example, in sports. This is actually interesting where all the wages and transfers and money are known. But uh, when you go to other, you know, professions, be it lawyer, doctor, whatever, you have actually no idea. I was uh, <coughs> suggesting at one time that what at the conferences, for the economist conferences, you often have people who are actually not equal in these conferences. Mm -hmm. You have people who are invited there, they are paid nothing, for example. Then you have people who are invited there and they're paid travel and maybe one or two days stay. And then you have pay people who are paid money to actually give talks. And they've flown uh, business class. <laughs> and they've flown business class. But I was actually suggesting that they should at least have, for people who are paid above a certain amount, let's be $1,000 or 2000 whatever number it is, that we should have at least an asterisk. You don't have to put like an exact amount, but you can actually have an asterisk because we need to know actually is this person there because he or she wanted to come and wanted to come, you know, with only expenses being covered, which I think is oftentimes reasonable, or is he or she there because he's actually making money from that conference. But, you know, it didn't get very far, actually. So, uh, you know, I wrote about that, but nobody picked it up.
Well, I'm not surprised. Well, um, there's plenty of other uh, policies that people have talked about, and you can read about many of these on the website, and I hope you do. But um, I also just wanted to spend uh, a second thanking Branco for everything he's done over the last 20 years to think about a more just and equitable world. So thank, thank you very much, John. Thank you very much for inviting. It was really a pleasure. All right. Thank you.